Hi guys, and welcome back to another video. So, to rephrase what I said in the last Bedwars video, and basically say it again, but in better detail, and not really rambling, since I've made a script this time. Hee <laughs> hee. Haha, uh -huh. I don't know. So, the world of ghosts has three types of ghosts, which you already know. And ghost is a faceless entity that has long bangs covering his face when he is in his humanoid form. When he was alive, he was outcast from his family and eventually killed by someone who didn't like his family. And they thought that his family would be devastated by his death, but the thing was, they weren't devastated. So Ghost dies tragically, left to rot in the shed of his killer. He becomes a ghost, and at first he cries for days. Over his death, over his current state, over his parent, parents, over his siblings. He was so angry at the world at first, but then he remembered his purpose as a ghost. Revenge. So he ditches that. He drove his killer to death, and he frightened his parents so much that they'd care about him. His siblings he couldn't care much for. He just wanted to get revenge, but something people should know about revenge is that while it's fun to get it, and you may feel good in the moment, most times you'll feel empty inside afterwards. While some cases can't be resolved with words, and you truly feel good afterwards, ghosts experience the feeling of emptiness after the people he resented were gone from the world. After that, he wandered a long time stuck in the human world he didn't get really get stuck in time he would exist for decades as a ghost before being revived when i first wrote him i only intended on keeping him as a ghost but then i kind of got bored one night and wanted to try and write something i absolutely didn't have the capability to write and to be honest i kind of cringe when i think back to the writing but basically ghost wouldn't get stuck in the past he was around for so long and saw so many things around him change he was basically there for people to start using the television and was around for when people started using phones. No, this I, first when I wrote this script, I thought that it would be too long to stop to talk about, but I can speak like a lot faster than I thought I could when I wrote this. I wrote that I was going to end, but I wanted to mention one last thing. The person who revived him was also gone because in order to bring back a life, you need to give up a life in the world of ghosts. So you may ask, who was the one who take care of him then? Well, they would be someone who was a f once a friend of his family, and before this gets confusing, yes, his family still exists. Now, because I made this into two parts, uh, the video is actually gonna- this script's just gonna be one part. I don't even want to imagine how many generations apart they'd be, because the timeline is a bit hard to figure out. All I know is that the radio was still a popular thing to sit around and listen to before he died. He was around 15 when he died and mentally would be 23 since the mental aging slowed down a lot. Obviously he'd be very old physically, technically still in a similar appearance, but since revival is a tricky thing and the first person to revive him was gone for like a few years, uh, while his body was repairing itself for those couple years of revival, I guess his body would kind of grow? I don't fucking know. Would they still be as old as they did when they died? No, I don't think they should, because obviously they spent tons of years. Mentally, they'd be aging, because, you know, they spend lots of years as a ghost. So, it's like, um, okay, it's like the, it's like, uh, that one character from the Dream SMP, we all know them, Revive Burr. His character died, and because Limbo in the Dream SMP is a lot faster, it makes them feel like they've been there a lot longer than they have. Like, Wilbur feels like he's been there 12 to 13 years, but in reality, he had only been there a couple of months. So the character did age. Uh, obviously, my story is different. I wrote it. I wrote the story before I knew about the Dream SMP. But it's a bit like that. The character would still be aging because, in one way or another, they're still kind of alive. Huh? How could I like? It's only four minutes. Can you believe that? I can write so much and also speak so much faster. Yet for some reason, I believed I could only say like a a page. I don't speak that slow do i no i don't i can speak quite fast oh right yeah the comics i wrote some small i drew some small comics you know so at first in the last video i realized things weren't really adding up how could he be attached to a teddy bear but also wander the earth so i was thinking what if it was a paranormal museum and he was attached to a teddy bear. He was supposed like he can only linger around that object. That's what he was linked to, chained to, really. So he would be in a paranormal museum, and people would like be taking pictures of him, because you know how ghost hunters are. You know how they are. So I think, 
how I could explain this better. Because in my mind, it kind of made sense. But when I start talking about it, it doesn't really make that much sense. So if I try to think about it, I can come up with this. There are two worlds. The one that is the paranormal world, it's its own little like space for just ghosts to go when they're done haunting the human world. And Ghost, because, you know, he had already fulfilled its purpose, he had nothing really else to do. So, he attached himself to that teddy bear, and like, I don't know, it was bought by a family at a pawn shop, and he messed with their house. But then, they decided to call some paranormal hunters, or like, the priest or whatever. And obviously the priest would be like, oh, this thing's haunted. And then the paranormal hunter, the paranormal investigators would be like, oh yeah, this is haunted. So they take it to a paranormal museum, because, you know, Ghost, he didn't really do much. He wasn't that much of a vengeful person to people who didn't hurt him. He just messed with their stuff, like turning off lights, turning on and off lights in their home, throwing open cabinets, slamming drawers, slamming doors. He pulled the blankets from people when they were sleeping. Obviously that terrified them a lot, but he never did anything to physically harm them, like leave scratches or bruises. He wasn't that kind of ghost. What he thought he was doing was fun. I guess with the people who he was haunting, it wasn't really fun. So he gets sent away to a paranormal museum because they think he's a threat, but he's not really a threat. If you also try to think about the implications of like his actions to the, the investigators, I guess it would kind of be a threat. You don't really know what ghosts would do unless you know a ghost, but you can't really know a ghost because the validity of ghosts is still debated. No one really knows if they're real. People can decide if they're real. People can decide if they're not real. So basically what just happens is that he gets sent away, he is locked in a box, and he stays there for quite a bit. He gets bored, obviously. There's only so much uh, people taking pictures of you that you can take. Before you just decide to, you know, exit the human world. Check out the paranormal world. See how, how, see how things are going there. And that in the story... Well, I never drew that comic. But it should be where he, where you are introduced to the different types of ghosts. Because there's, uh, there's like so many different types of ghosts in like different cultures. Like, ghosts in the western, western media... They look pretty similar throughout all of them. You have your Victorian era women and men, and then you have your little uh, entities with sheets over them with eyes cut out for their, well, with holes cut out for their eyes. But then other cultures, you have different types of ghosts or entities that would be similar to ghosts, like yokai, but they aren't really ghosts. Because what I think a ghost is, is simply the remaining soul of a person who has died. Or their energy that's still there. I don't typically, I don't actually like genuinely believe in it. I think it's pretty cool to believe in it. Like if I if I could believe in it, I think it'd be pretty cool. Okay, I half believe and I half don't believe. Because I know the explanations for some stuff that happens, like wind or the EMF just actually making you feel anxious, but it's not a ghost causing that. I know, so I know how some things work, and I know how some things can be staged to look like they're ghosts, but they're not really. I think I should like look up some ghost stories to, re to read. It would be nice. I'm trying to find some. I wonder if I can find any to read, actually. There's scary stories to tell in dark. That's always nice. Yeah, I I'll read one. Hmm. We got The Thing, and then Harold. Also, The Hook, Bloody Fingers, The Babysitter, Room for one more. Oh, I like room for one more. I'm gonna read that one. Hmm. Okay, this has the story. Yeah. There was a young woman who had just started a new job in a large office building. She was walking to work one day when a, long, when a long black hearse drove up slowly next to her, matching her pace. This made her nervous and she anxiously watched it out of the corner of her eye. The driver leaned out of the window and called to her in a deep, booming voice. Do you need a lift? She turned to look at him got a terrible she learned she turned to look at him got a, and got a terrible shock the driver's face was incredibly hideous and deformed his skin was a deathly pale and one of his eyes was notice, noticeably higher than the other the man pointed to the rear of the vehicle which went, contained a coffin 
Room for one more, he said. Frightened by his bizarre appearance and unwelcome suggestion, she refuses the offer on, of a lift. Profoundly disturbed, the woman ran down the street until she came to the office building where she worked. For, us, for the rest of the day, she couldn't stop thinking about the strange men in the hearse, and was glad when the workday was over. The woman worked, worked up on the ninth floor, and when the elevator came, it was almost completely full. She hesitated a moment before stepping in. Are you sure you don't want to come in? Asked a familiar, booming voice. There's room for one more. The woman gasped. It was the hearse driver from this morning, eyeing her with its lopsided, horrible gaze. Now thoroughly spooked, the woman backed away, stuttering. I, I think I'll take the stairs. The hearse driver just stared at her as the doors slid closed. The woman had only taken a few steps down the stairs when she heard a chorus of screams followed by a deafening crash. She hurried downstairs and discovered the elevator cable had broken and all the passengers aboard had plunged to a grisly death. That elevator thing reminds me of a bit. It reminds me of something. Elevators, when they were invented, I think when they were first invented, they could have had a free fall ability. But I, th I don't remember elevators being that high up when they were first invented anyway, so you'd only fall a little bit. But elevators nowadays have crazy, like, a crazy amount of precautions put in place to prevent a free fall. Like, the elevator cable is super, super strong. It can carry tons of people and tons of weight. It wouldn't break so easily. And also, uh, there's things on the side of the shaft for the elevator that stop it from falling. So if an elevator failed, you'd only be stuck in a certain area because the elevator would be locked in place. You know? It's like those stories of people getting stuck in an elevator. Like, it would just be... Like, right below the door, like, you could still get out because they'd open the door and there'd be a small space for you to, like, get out if with someone's help. I'm just looking at some scary stories for kids. <laughs> They're not all that scary. This one's called The Drum. Once upon a time, there were two little girls. Their names were Blue Eyes and Turkey. Blue Eyes was named after the color of her eyes and, blue and Turkey after the red dress she wore. They lived in a little house on the moor with their mother and their baby brother, Arthur. Their father was a sailor, and he was always at, away at sea, traveling to faraway lands. One day, Blue Eyes and Turkey went for a walk upon the moor when they met a blank girl playing on a little drum. I don't want to say it because I do know it's kind of a Romani slur. As she played, a little mechanical man and woman came out of the drum and danced. Blue Eyes and Turkey were enchanted. They had never seen such an amazing toy, and they begged the girl to give them the drum. The girl just laughed. I will give it to you, she said, but only if you are very naughty. Come back tomorrow and tell me how naughty you were. Then we shall see. The girl just laughed. You know, as soon as Blue Eyes and Turkey got home, they began to behave as badly as they could. They started shouting, they spilled their food on the floor, they drew all over the walls with their crayons and refused to go to bed. The two sisters did everything they could think of to to upset their mother. The next day, they got up very early and hurried out onto the moor. There they found the, they found the girl playing on her drum. We were very naughty yesterday, they cried. Can we please have the drum now? Tell me what you did, the girl replied. So they told her. The girl just laughed. Oh no, she said. You're only a little bit naughty. You're going to have to be as far worse than that if you want this drum. As, for, as soon as the girls got home that day, they were as naughty as they could be. They threw their cups on the floor, they tore their clothes, they walked in the mud up to their knees and pulled up all the flowers in the garden. They also let the pig out of the pen and let it run away. Their mother was even more horrified than before by their behavior. If you don't stop this, said the mother, I will go away and take Arthur with me and you will, never, you will get a new mother, one with glass eyes and a wooden tail. That scared Blue Eyes and Turkey. They loved their mother, and they loved their baby brother, Arthur. They could not imagine being without them, and the thought of it made them cry. I don't want to leave you, their mother said, but unless you change your behavior, I will have to go away. We'll be good, the girls promised, yet they did not believe that their mother would really go away. We'll get the drum tomorrow, said Turkey. Then we can go back to being good again. The next day, the girls got up very early and rushed off to meet the girl. When they found her, she was playing with the drum again, and the little mechanical man and a woman were dancing back and forth. They told the girl how naughty they had been the day before. That must be bad enough to get the drum, they said. 
Oh no, replied the girl with a smile. You will have to be much worse than that. But we promised our mother we would be on our best behavior from now on, said the sisters. If you really want the drum, said the girl, you must be naughtier. It's only for one day, Blue Eyes told Turkey. Then we will have the drum. I hope you're right, Turkey said, nervously. Again, she told them they had not been naughty enough. You must be really bad, she said. As soon as they got home that evening, the young girl set about us being as naughty as, as possible. This time, they broke the kitchen table and chairs. They smashed all the fine china and ripped their clothes to shreds. As if that wasn't enough, the girls whipped the dog unmercifully. They beat their baby brother with a stick and they punched their mother in the face. Their mother began to cry. Blue eyes and turkey, she sobbed. You're not keeping your promise. If you don't stop being naughty, I will have to go away and instead you will have a new mother with glass eyes and a wooden tail to live with you. We will be good, said blue eyes. We promise, said turkey. I hope so. I can't wait much longer. Please try to behave yourselves. However, the two girls still had their hearts set on the amazing drum, and when they were alone, they said to each other, Tomorrow we will be good. Once we have got the drum, we will be good again. Early the next morning, before their mother was awake, Blue Eyes and Turkey ran out onto the moor. There they found the girl. They told her about all the bad things they had done the day before. We were horrid, said Turkey. We were worse than we have ever been, said Blue Eyes. You have to give us the drum now. That was when they noticed that the girl wasn't playing with the drum. In fact, it was nowhere to be seen. Where's the drum? The sisters cried. The girl just laughed. It is gone. We are all going away today. I am the last to leave. But we did as you told us, cried Blue Eyes and Turkey. The girl laughed again. Yes, I know, she said. You have been really naughty, and now your mother has gone away. Far, far away. And instead you have a mother with glass eyes and a wooden tail. Blue Eyes and Turkey began to cry. They rushed, as, they rushed home as quickly as they could, but their mother and Arthur were gone. Maybe they're just out shopping, Blue, said Blue Eyes, hopefully. Yes, they'll be back soon, I'm sure of it, said Turkey, trying to reassert herself. But when lunchtime came and went, they were still not back. Blue Eyes and Turkey began to feel lonely and scared. They wandered about on the moor all day, but when evening came, they went back home. The light in the house were off. Well, the lights in the house were off. But when they peered through the window, they could see their new mother's glass eyes glistening in the glow of the firefly, of the firelight, and they could hear her wooden tail thumping on the floor. This comment on the website is saying about like another story. Oh, there's more. St there's more stories. I remember reading one of these stories, but I can't remember which one it was. I'm gonna try to find one. This one, the dream, has like a- the, the picture for that one looks very similar to something I've seen for like that scary story to tell in the dark, uh, movie. You remember that? Yeah, there's, um, there's a movie for the book, and it, it had like so amazing, like, I don't know how to call it, like, effects? Like, the costuming for all the monsters was awesome, and one of them was like a woman who, she kind of reminds me of a potato with her shape, and she's wearing a dress. She has, like, long black hair and a really wide mouth. And yeah, that's the thumbnail, and that, that looks like the thumbnail for the dream. I'm going to read this one. It's called The Dead Hand. There's a small village in Ireland that lay on the, le on the edge of a large bog. The marshy land stretched as far as the eye could see, dotted with small bushy weeds and the skeletons of tall, ragged trees with branches that reached out like long, twisted arms. The soggy ground could be dangerous because it was riddled with many deep bog holes that were filled with black, murky water. The bog holes were often hidden behind clumps of foliage, and it was important to watch your step. If a man accidentally fell down a bog hole, he would never come up again. It was a fearsome place. If all the tales told about it are true, it was before my time, but I have, but I have heard many a strange story about the bog, and it would make your skin creep. Just listen to them. Every day, the men in the village went out into the bog and toiled for hours, cutting the turf. They loaded it up onto wheelbarrows and hauled it home to dry it in the sun. They used the turf for fuel, burning it in the fireplace to heat their homes. They were also able to sell it to make money. But after the sun had set, nobody would dare venture out in the darkness onto that desolate, desolate bog. In the moonlight, the wind would whistle through the dead branches of twisted trees. Those who lived nearby would often glimpse strange shapes creeping out across the desert, 
Those who live nearby would often glimpse strange shapes creeping across the, des the deserted stretch of swamp. There were rumors throughout the village that strange creepers, creatures emerged from the bog holes at night. People were so afraid that they refused to leave their homes after dark. There's only one person in the village who, not, who did not believe in, the, in these creatures. A tall young man by the name of Tom McCannis. Everybody knew him as Long Tom. On his way home from work, as the light began to fade, he'd, he'd often whisper to his friend, There's one! And they would jump and run. And Tom would laugh and laugh. Finally, some of his friends turned on him. If you know so much, they said, why don't you go out onto the bog some night and see what happens to you? I'll do it, said Long Tom. Sure, don't I work out there every day? Not once have I ever seen anything to frighten me. Why would it be different at night? Tomorrow night, I'll take my lantern and walk out to the hanging willow tree in the middle of the bog. If I get scared and run, I'll never make fun of you again. The next night, the men went to Long Tom McCannis' house to see if I was away. If it was the black- if- it was the blackest of nights, and thick clouds obscured the moon, blocking out the light. When they arrived, Tom's mother was pleading him not to go. I'll be alright, he said. There's nothing to be afraid of. Don't be foolish like the rest. He took his lantern and, singing to himself, headed down the path that led to the bog. Some of the men wondered if Tom wasn't right. Maybe they were afraid of things that did not accept it, that did not exist. A few decided to follow him and see for themselves, but they stayed far behind in case he ran into trouble. They were sure they saw dark shapes moving about, but Tom's lantern kept bobbing up and down, and Tom's voice kept floating back to them, and nothing happened. Finally, they caught sight of the willow tree. There was Tom standing in the circle of light, looking this way and that, whistling a happy tune. All of a sudden, the wind blew out his lantern, and Tom stopped whistling. The men stood silent and still in the blackness, and in the blackness straining their eyes to see and waiting for something awful to happen. When the clouds shifted and the moon peeked out again, they caught a glimpse of Long Tom. His back was up against the willow tree, and his arms were out in front of him, as if he was fighting something off. It seemed like the very darkness was alive with slimy, creeping things. Strange shapes were swirling about him. They could hear loud wails and awful moaning sounds. Then the clouds covered the moon again, and once again, once more, it was black as pitch. By now, the men were on their knees, praying for dear life and calling upon the Virgin Mary and all the saints to protect them. When the moon came out again, Tom's face was as pale as death. He was desperately hanging onto the willow tree with one arm. His other arm was stretched out in front of him, and something was pulling on it. It looked like a disembodied hand with rotting flesh dropping off the moldy bones, and it had a tight grasp on poor, arm on poor Tom's arm. Stronger and stronger it pulled until at last Tom lost his grip on the tree and was dragged off into the night, shrieking like a soul in hell. That's what the men said they witnessed before Tom was swallowed up by the darkness. When the clouds blotted out the moon once more, the men turned and ran through the blackness towards the village. Again and again they lost the path and fell into the muck, struggling to avoid the deadly bog holes. In the end they crawled back on their hands and knees, but Tom McCannis was not with them. In the morning, the people searched everywhere for Tom. Finally, they gave him they gave him up for lost. That evening, the villagers heard a cry. It was Tom's mother. She was rushing down the path from the bog, shouting and waving. When the villagers spotted her, she frantically gestured them for them to follow her. Struggling to overcome their fears, the villagers, the villagers ran after her, and when she came to a stop, they found young Tom Candace slumped, ag slumped against a willow tree, shaking and gibbering as if he had lost his mind. His left hand was raised in the air, pointing, and his wild eyes were staring at something only he could see. Where his right hand should have been, there was nothing more than a bloody stump. It had been ripped clean off. Nobody ever knew for sure what it was that he had seen. Some people claimed that he had been attacked by the dead hand, and others said that that was just the talk of a drunken, superstitious fools. The only person who really knew what happened that night was young Tom McCannis, but he never spoke another word again. He spent the rest of his short life barricaded in his bedroom, shaking and trembling through the long nights. He didn't make it to the end of the year when they lowered him into this grave. His grieving mother cried out to the people gathered in the churchyard and begged them to never be so foolhardy as to venture out onto the cursed bog on the middle of the night. That's the story. That's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool story. Anyway, if you liked this video, subscribe and like. If you didn't, well, comment that you didn't. It still helps me gain traction anyway. So, uh, yeah. Goodbye.